Hello, everybody, and welcome to Lowdown on Low Code. Today we have actually a really interesting guest, somebody that we've been wanting to have on uh, for, for quite a while. Um, you may know him as the godfather of RPA. Um, we know him as um, Francis Cardin. Um, Francis joins us today from from Atlanta, um, and uh, and we're gonna we're gonna tease out why low code is so important. You'll notice I'm not here with my usual co-host Brian Dugan. I'm here with John Reimer. How are you today, John? Very well, Rob. Good to be here, Francis. Great to be able to talk to you. Likewise, John. Good to see you, Francis. We like to start all of these off with. I mean, we've had these. We've had this amazing luck with the guests that we've had who have just the most fascinating histories in in this space. And I know yours is particularly fascinating. Francis, how did you come to be here? How did you become to, to get to this to get to this spot in the industry? Yeah, thanks, Rob. And, uh, you know, this is great to be uh, invited here. And uh, I've been listening to all your other podcasts and you've had some interesting guests. And if anybody's listening to this just because it's me, go back and listen to the rest of them as well. I doubt that's true, but, you know, I'm going to give you a plug. Um, <laughs> how did I get here? You know, I left school at 15. Um, uh, I, I struggled a bit at school simply because I wanted to learn the why and they didn't teach the why. It was just more factual. So I, that wasn't for me. Um, by the age of 17, I got into, by accident, uh, a computer company. Um, <laughs> it's not as great as it sounds. I was actually just cleaning out the coffee cups and ashtrays of the training center. <laughs> <laughs> but as part of that, I got to also load the backup tapes, and they gave me a program to support, which was their mailing program. And so I started to teach myself programming. Um, I never liked the fact that I couldn't understand the programs they gave me because they weren't very well written. They weren't very readable. So I would hack around through the learning process and make them readable, make them understandable and make them more modularized and just make them more efficient. So a few years doing that, I became a benchmark guru, a performance guru that just happened to be. Optimization came totally by accident. It must have always been in my blood, I guess. Um, and I became a guru for that company, traveling all over the world doing consulting. But fast forward, the age of 25, I started my first company, I decided to take the plunge. And uh, we built a terminal emulation business. This is back when we just got the PCs introduced and people were turning these smart PCs in, back into dumb terminals. They were running software that emulated the friggin' dumb terminal that we were trying to get rid of. Um, so anyway, I built that business. It was the Intelligent Terminal Emulator. Bought it to the US in 96, sold the company in uh, 2001, took a sabbatical for a few years, and then in 2005 started an RPA company. It was an RPA back then, of course. It was screen scraping. Uh, that was the terminology used when it was very prevalent for many years prior. And then in 2016, I sold that to Pegasystems and uh, worked with Pegasystems up until October last year. So I got to meet all the founders and work with them uh, on this lo low code trajectory for what? A good seven, eight years. And it's been a, been, that's a fast pace through my, my journey. There. <laughs> Great. Great. Um, RPA. Uh, comes up a lot, Francis, uh, in in discussions with more than uh, it should. More than it should. <laughs> well, it comes up a lot. There was a big, big, you know, as you know, there was a big uh, period of, of very high, of, of of high adoption. Um, how how you you have really uh, pivoted your work, and you're now very passionate about low code and about its potential. How did you get from RPA to a passion about low code? Weirdly, it's actually the other way around, John. So it's an interesting mm -hmm. question. So like many of your other guests, been around for a while. And my first foray, when I said I went to go to work for this computer company, self-taught, et cetera, they bought into a low code company. But back then it wasn't called low code, just as RPA wasn't called RPA. Um, it was called fourth generation languages. So three GLs became four GLs. Four GLs were more prompt based. You could build applications without being a hardcore developer. You could, you had to be a programmer. You had to understand programming nuances, mm -hmm. which was then my, by that, by that point, I'd learned that. So mm -hmm. when this company acquired a product called all application language liberator of all things, which became known as pro four, this is back in the mm -hmm. early eighties, which is yep. still viable. You can still buy it to this day. And a few years ago, I noticed that they changed their term from 4GL to low code, funny enough. 
Um, so that's how I got into it. I, I, when I started my first company, there was a PC version of this. And actually, I built my own ledgers in there in this Pro 4 uh, all product. So I built my application in that. And uh, I've been doing a lot of that. But back to that history, though, I was always interested in why programs that business people needed to use were so hard to understand. Mm -hmm. you know, why did people program things with great intentions to be a great program, but it ended up being this monolithic spaghetti sprawl of code that nobody wanted to touch post-event? And mm -hmm. so when I met Alan Treffler in 2016, when he was looking to buy OpenSpan, we got talking about the very thing. Why is it called low code, not 4GLs? Should it be called 5GL? He laughed, but said no. <laughs> so, you know, um, he, still, he still bought my company, so we must have got along. And that's really the history. And so in between that, this RPA thingy was all about, because I guess applications were so hard to customize and modernize, that they automated it from the glass, the screen mm -hmm. scraping, the RPA products we see today. Mm -hmm. And I was probably the only one that sold RPA with the, but do know this is a stopgap. I'm not selling you something strategic. It's practical at best, tactical probably, because you can optimize uh, this rote work, this, this boring work. You know, I always focused on the attended RPA, which allowed us to deliver, you know, tens of thousands of bots at great scale because it just automated it become what I guess what you would consider a co-pilot today with AI, but it was screen scraping alongside the user. It was screen scraping whilst the user could still interact with the PC, which is typically not not possible with RPA. So we had a great run, great success. We sold hundreds of thousands of users. And when Alan, when Pegasystems bought us, it was perfect because it then allowed what I was really trying to tell people, RPA is part of a bigger solution and you should build your bots with an end of life strategy to eventually be replaced, right? The underlying systems would be replaced with something more tangible, which right. once I was at Pega for me was low code and no code. Makes sense. So that, yeah, that it, yes, it, it does, does make sense, Francis. And, um, and, and let's probe on that a little bit. I mean, it's not specific to Pega, but Pega is an interesting, uh, an interesting company to bring to bear on here, you know, in this. So when John, w way back when, in, when John and I started this research, we, we would have thought of, of, of Pega as maybe a classic BPM company. They, they were kind of playing, you know, in that high end sophisticated market. They obviously are still, are still really strong in that market, but, but they have, they have a really good low code development environment we were always re really impressed with that and, and of course now they have the open span piece so if you go into an orchestration world you know you could pull in rpa where you need it right but 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 i think you know if i if i look at pega and others messaging in the area i see increasingly kind of shifting from digital process automation to, to, to more and more low code more and more attempts to embrace the business in a meaningful way and, and drive that long tail of automation john and i and and ryan and and dave we spent a lot of time talking about this this long tail of, of automation and, and how low code you know can, can be a part of that and, and obviously rpa can play a, a role in that what are your thoughts on that is, is that sort of you know one of the big drivers that that brought you in, into this into this into this low code world so, so again i goes back to you know my my brain always wanted to try to improve everything right i couldn't understand why coding being so powerful the people that coded actually don't like to make it look pretty or nice they just wanted to get it done and move on to the next project so we've had 40 years of this spaghetti of code Right. Let's be honest. I don't know a single developer that likes to touch anyone else's code. In fact, they don't even like to touch their own code because <laughs> it's like it's, you know, it's built with great intentions. Then it's rushed. It's hurried. And then for the next 15, 20 years, it's hacked and hacked again and copied and repeated and whatever. So I, I don't even like the term automation, really, because automation mm -hmm. is, is kind of like it's the right term. But it's also the wrong one. We had computerization before automation because we took the work that humans did and replicated it on a computer, pretty much replicated it. But then what happened is we took all that code for the next 30, 40 years, as I said, and then just we just messed around with it. But the reality is, is that in today's, if we leap forward to what autonomous is a term or neuronomous is my term, which is like an interjection of all the technologies, which basically says, let's stop building applications as if we have to code them. We rethink the way a process should be, the way it should be if a computer was to do it, if there was never a human in the loop. 
and only build a process for some of the, for some of those exceptions where you need a human to bring back you know, it might be variability or something you've not even coded yet i think that's the leap for me i'm, I'm even beyond low code I've, I've been doing low code and no code for many decades indirectly making drag and drop got the term low code right that became low code i mean everything's low code everything's automation but it's right. not i think of enterprise application software is entering a new era where people are talking about we're going to have gen ai generate code well that's just proof code isn't what you need why can't gen ai generate something that's interpretive that's understandable that's readable by humans right what does it even need to be code if it's going to be gen ai generate code let's generate assembler of course that's a stupid statement but it's not as stupid as, as generating any type of code so low code to me is actually more of a passion now. Software, rethink it from the from the top down, not the bottom up of the way we've had code for decades, but rethink the business process. Imagine how you would put it into the, a structure and you would allow Gen AI or low code or whatever, Gen AI and low code, no code, generate the app. And if you want to replace it or upgrade it, it should take minutes, not years, right? If you want to add a new feature, it shouldn't take as long as it does. And that's to me how I got into this. And I'm more passionate this year than I was even last year. And thanks to your podcast and realizing I'm not alone in thinking <laughs> that this isn't the way we should be building software anymore. And I am, you know, I think Gary said it from Uncork. He calls it codeless. I mean, I just think this is just, just stop building in code for enterprise apps. It's not necessary anymore. And I'm going to shout it until I die. Francis, I love your comment about um, rethinking, so rethinking software, rethinking apps. <laughs> um, I wonder what you think of the, you know, the classic framing or one of the classic framings for in the discussions of low code is, can you use these low code techniques to build core applications, mission critical applications, or is it really just good for the applications around the edges, which, you know, commonly called the long tail? Do you think that framing itself needs to go away or needs to somehow be replaced with something else? I think it sometimes overcomplicates it, um, but I, I see why it's necessary. So if you think about the systems engineering, right, the coding of the very systems that these products live on and run on, the security, the governance, the compliance, systems engineering, true hardcore developers, love them, we need them, won't yep. necessarily invite many of them over for dinner <laughs> because they don't want to come to dinner. That's not, that's not their mindset, right? There's a few exceptions to that I've met in my life and they're fantastic. But business people understand the business problem, the business processes. And, you know, we can use BPM, we can call it a process or a task. We call these things, but at the end of the day, just need to get something done. We onboard a customer or we need to pay them their claim or something, right? Well, we keep going back to thinking about how it used to be done before computers right? It's not that difficult. None of this stuff is that difficult. And yet we've got billions of lines of code that show how difficult it is. Yeah. Whereas when you go to a low code, no code, and they're not all perfect. Some are better than others. You, you've done the, 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 um, the, the waves to reflect that. I love DPA, by the way. DPA was, for me, at last, someone that said that it's a space and there are a number of technologies that make the space up. DPM was part of it. RPA was part of it. Uh, rules engines was part of it. All of those things are very critical. But sadly, you guys took away all the weightings and stuff and just my myriad of that. But I would like we to see it go back. We did, and somebody that's... did, but it wasn't us. Somebody did. No, worries. I'm not blaming anybody. It went away. Anyway, <laughs> it was music. One. It was music to my ears because it weighted them as well, and it was kind of whether it's a fair weighting or not on all of them didn't really matter, right? But it was the right way to think of it. So software, application software for enterprises is not hard to build. It's not. And if anything, people are talking about Gen AI now going through and generating code or fixing your code or finding out what's wrong with your code or telling programmers what they did wrong. Oh, well, 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 stop. Why code? Why does it have to now be code? And so for enterprise application, you talk about the long tail of automation. Just, just almost drop the word automation for a second and just imagine I need to get something done. Can I ask somebody or something to do it for me? What would it look like? And I use this example a lot. Driving license validation is made up of set of tasks and rules that, that, that make it up. It's, and it's finite, right? One government might be different to another government or another country to another country, but it's finite. Yet right. there are probably 10,000 or maybe even 100,000 different versions of code. Some of the business logic or the rule exists in the UI. Some of it exists in the data layer. Some of it exists in the application layer. And nobody knows where it all exists, right. right? Whereas if we built that once 
and we shared that with everybody, then nobody needs to build that. And I think probably 70 to 80% of all business applications should be built once and shared. And if you really want to own the IP for the driving license validation, sure, go ahead and build your own, right? And congratulations to IT for having a better driving license validation. I don't think IT should care. They should get in the business of doing what IT should care about, which is to keep the lights on governed and secure. Let the applications be something more predominant. And I'm passionate about the reuse library, what I call an action library or task library, where anytime anything is built in low code or no code or code, it should be visible, viewable. And let's use AI to say, oh, you're trying to build something. I've already got that for you. Now, mm -hmm. that could be a low code object or, 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 or something in the library, or it could be a piece of code. But we should pass the point of having 10,000 copies of the same piece of code doing the same thing. And that is me rethinking the way software should be built. Right. Yeah. So listen, I've got to, I want to bring us in a, diff, a little different direction that, that builds on this, but, but I can't miss this opportunity to ask a question or, or to ask something, something of John. John, Francis said you can't bring the developers over to your house for dinner. Do, do you have a, do you have a, do you have some, do you have a joke you'd like to share with us for that? <laughs> Francis, do, do you know how you can tell uh, a, um, an extroverted developer from an introverted developer? One's lying. I don't know. Go on. <laughs> the extroverted developer looks at your shoes when he talks to you. <laughs> and there is... Love it. Love and it. there, and there hey, in, <laughs> is proof that Chase and I fair. have been doing this together for way too long. <laughs> Sorry. No, listen, it's harsh but fair, and they wouldn't mind. I had one of the best CTOs, right, you could imagine. He's He was like a, a fantastic coder. And he came to a house party once and he literally didn't talk to my wife. We were hosting the party and my wife was very upset about it. I'm like, why? He's helping me build a company that's going to make us a lot of money. Do you want him just to be nicer at dinner or do you want him to do that job? <laughs> it is what it is. And he's a fantastic guy. I get on with him really well, which is why we built a great company. But they, they don't, it, it's, I think it's fine. Great. Thankfully, the world is made up of people with different characteristics. That's what I'm Absolutely. Sure. And, and in fairness to can... CEOs everywhere, um, Don would talk to your wife, right? Don is. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't confuse, don't confuse what I said, right? It's nothing to do really with IT. It's just to do with an engineering, a systems engineer developer who programmed right. probably in the early days in Assembler. And this guy did. He built a game and sold a game online. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're a gaming developer, God help you. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> But it's nothing I want to do. <laughs> Let's go the exact opposite way from 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 these folks and say, okay, everybody in in the organization who's trying to solve a business problem. To your point, Francis, we're not trying to automate; we're just trying to get business done, and, and that's the job of everybody in the organization. This, I think, is is the the central theme of why this why John and I are so passionate about this because we feel like low code has proven itself right as as a technology unambiguously. But this vision that we had that everybody would be more deeply involved in driving business optimization, I, I don't think we're quite there yet. And one of the one of the theories that 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 we've been working on here at analysis.tech is that there is this kind of different form of a of a of a um, center of excellence um, th that is in a support role, in an enablement role, in a change management role. Um, but is sort of centrally in IT maintaining governance and security and, and you know, lifecycle management and design standards and things like that. Are we smoking the curtains or, 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 or is this how you're thinking of, of, of a potential central role as well? I think of it slightly differently. I think of that all of those things need to be done. Right. It, it's this is IT's job. It's the backbone of your of the computerization era. It's the backbone of everything you do. But if we try to make it that the, it, and then whatever business does upstream should inherit from that. I don't even need to, need to know they need to be involved. They just need to know that what they're building on, whatever platform they're building on, IT has been involved and got their back. It's the same thing. Look at how we're trusting today cloud. Right. I remember not that long ago, a big bank said to me, we're never going cloud, big UK bank, never going cloud. That was only 2016. And now they've almost everything is on cloud. So they don't have to manage the hardware or the operating systems or the infrastructure, or the networking or the cabling. Oh, it's gone. Right. Who cares? But you trust it. 
So business build things upstream or they load an application and they run it and they store their stuff in the cloud and they trust it because IT is doing that. You don't need a COE to bridge that gap. Now, you do need a COE where there is an overlap and the, and the, 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 the gap is closing because it's being more inherited from the infrastructure underneath. Thank the Lord, right? Because we've had 40 years of this coding. Like I said, we to, do, do you remember the days when we had to choose a hardware vendor and an operating system and a language to write it? They're gone now, right? And, yeah. and if, in, in fact, low code would have been successful 40 years ago if we had then what we have today which actually is why I think that we will see a doubling or even a quadrupling in the size of the low code, no code business, because it is the way to build software. Anybody can argue with me if they like, I love arguments, right? There is no argument for why you should not build software in code anymore. Enterprise applications, it's done. And we have all the technology at our fingertips to do that. And there are, there are numerous low code, no code vendors, codeless era, right? But the terminology was maybe before its time. Right. That's the sad part about it. And so people still carry this baggage about we need the COE because we're doing this. We do, And we do. Listen, don't get me wrong. We need it. But I think it's getting smaller because of inheritance. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to know if I build something tomorrow, even in SharePoint, that it's governed. My company's let me use SharePoint. And I'm going to store a file. It's governed. Right. I don't need to take care of security. I don't need to talk to anybody in IT or need a COE to tell me that the access to this system they've given me is secure. And that's what the low code, no code vendors have been doing for a long time. And with Gen AI and with all the other cloud, the elasticity, the compute power that's coming, I think it's boiling this opportunity for low code, no code, that business can get their hands around building applications fast, throwing it away if it doesn't work because you build it so fast, but more likely you're just going to continue to adapt. So this is the end of legacy because we won't ever have to custom, uh, uh, customize anything, which was the Achilles heel of coding, right? This would just be, Applications will adapt. Users can adapt the application to look like they want at an individual level. The business can adapt it to make sure that it, it, it adds new capabilities and features that need to compete on. But if you had to go back to a COE and wait six to 12 months for a new feature to be coded, it's too late. And then of course, someone's gonna support that code. That's, that's right. that, does that make sense? So COEs are important, but becoming less and less important as the ability to build Enterprise application software inherits the security underneath. That is the C that is the systems engineers and the CTO's job, in my opinion. Yeah, it I, sounds I think like what we well, picture it, here, John. Let me uh, just real quick. I, th I think what we're picturing might be something like, and I think COE might be a, a term that we got to get rid of and, and come up with a different name, John. Because we're picturing something that's more enablement and support focused, right? So I need right. this application to work somewhat differently. I could probably do it on myself, my own in low code, but I can't. I need some help. I need access to a back end system or I need something. I need some advice. I need somebody to turn to. That might become more of an enablement role of, of the COE, one of many things that we do. So th this is, this is I it, think, a, a big topic that we're going to have to tackle, John. Yeah. yeah, I think also COEs, John, just before you, you could grab that, this, the, the problem I've also seen is people create a COE for, say, RPA. That's just yeah. such a mistake, it, it, unless it's subservient to the CEO, uh, to, to the COE, right? The COE yeah. must be something predominant that the business is, is putting out where their direction is. Right. And then you can have subservient oh. uh, uh, COEs. Oh. But oh, Fred, I'm it, sorry, I've got to share a story because because every once in a while something comes up that still causes me pain. So huge <laughs> healthcare provider. This is like probably 2017. Huge healthcare provider comes up and says, okay, you know, we, we've got a COE for digital process automation, all the kind of that, that's that whole class of automation built on an application. We've got a COE for the RPA and, and people bring projects to them. Um, and I say, well, how do you decide which technology you're using? They were separate in this organization at the time. They go, whoever gets the call does the project. So... <laughs> <laughs> no, please stop. Anyway, sorry, well, it, John. <laughs> Francis, it sounds like it sounds uh, interpreting your what, you know your position on COEs. It sounds like it's sort of similar to the way you viewed RPA is in that it's a transitional step, mm -hmm. and the COE will succeed if it puts itself out of business because it it essentially teaches the organization new or it helps the organization adopt new practices that make the coe unnecessary it's just people solving business issues and 
What, before it, be, well, what was it called before COE? I can't remember exactly the term, but we would used to have, a, a, there would be a team that would oversight what was going on technically in the world. It would look at new products, new technologies, evolving strategies. They would be talking to the analysts what's coming. So I think that acts as the bridge between IT and the business. It just doesn't need to get so mismashed into thinking that it's as big a problem as it was. It all, it, the reason for the growth of COEs was because it was technically hard for business to understand what the hell IT was doing. But if right. we move to this low code, no code era, we move to this where we can get to understand everything that's being done, right? We get these reuse libraries. We get this ability to build without having to say, IT, my IT is better at building the driving license validation or my IT team's better at building the, the software for enabling HR to onboard clients. It's, it doesn't matter. And if you look at the small to mid-sized companies, they've solved that. I mean, how many different yeah. accounting applications are there out there now, right? They don't go and build their own. They don't go and say, oh, I'm going to start a new business. I need someone who can build in my accounting app. It's done, right? right. And so right. we are moving from this computerization era into this neuronomous era. And I do believe that any, I just, I would like to talk to people that don't believe in low code, no code, right? And, and give me all the reasons why it won't work. Because we know it works. I'm only going to say it hasn't grown as much as it could have and should have because we've been held back by the legacy strangulation and maybe we needed to settle, but we've now got everything we need. We're perfectly poised to do what we should have always been able to yep. do, which is not make the code the center of our problem. <laughs> so that's what code is, the COP. <laughs> so great. Um, I love legacy strangulation. Um, one of the, one of the forms of legacy strangulation that we've been seeing and trying to, trying to help people with is funding and budgeting and as Rob, Rob uses the term change management, organizational change management. So what the classic, the, the classic example I like to, to use is the organization that funds all technology efforts project by project. And so if you're going to seek to, um, say, develop a shared library of components, as you're describing, um, doing it project by project is going to take you forever if you ever get there. You 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 need investment generally outside of the project, and it it just seems like there's it's such a difficult transition. This is such a difficult financial tr transition for companies that is holding back uh, the the promise of, of low code. And I I wonder if you see that or what you know what how you, how you sort of see people managing that transition in funding and budgeting? Well, the funding and budgeting comes about often because people don't calculate the true total cost of ownership of all that legacy strangulation, right? Yeah. We see that with RPA when someone says, oh, we've got a 10% ROI. Yeah, if you ignore the 90% TCO, yes, it's 10%. But if you include it, it's 2%. And then is it worth it at 2%, right? So I do think that we've got this whole uh, mis 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 mismatch of what it takes to build something new. And there is no denying that what you can build brand new today from scratch. There's a bank called Starling Bank that built a banking application and they went live and they, I don't know, do a billion in assets and this year they made their first profit. But you know what they've done? They're now allowing other banks, startups, to go build a bank, a digital bank. They built it in such a way as a platform, reusable bunch of assets, that they can enable a competitor to go build a bank. So that bank can start up without having to have that big investment. It proves it works. Nobody can deny that bank isn't trading and isn't doing a good job. They've got credit accounts, checking, et cetera. So it's real. Um, I don't think, you know, like same reason that the, the, the bank that said we're never going cloud and recognize the value in cloud is so, you know, let's be honest, cloud is a subscription in perpetuity. You're paying your cloud vendor, or if it's hybrid cloud, hopefully you can hold them to account. That's where software is going. You're going to end up paying someone else in perpetuity to manage it unless you want to write code. But good luck with that. And then and then you've got the other issue, which is that the cost of these coders, if you keep the old code around, it's getting more expensive. Coding programmers are hard to find and they're expensive. So mm -hmm. what are people doing? They're turning to Gen AI to go through their 40 years of code to try to make it more understandable. I'm like, really? Okay, that, that's okay. So now if you are a developer, programmer, Watch your back, because just as the contact center was measuring call center agents down to the second and then net promoter scores and their, and, and their, a, their AHT, AI is going to watch all these developers, see how well they code. Oh, no, that's bad code. Sorry, we're going to report you. Oh, you shouldn't have written it this way. It's already been done. Gen AI is going to do that. It's going to literally watch you like we watch call center agents. 
So moving anyway to this model of low code, no code, not only makes you more productive, but it removes all that future strangulation. There is no such thing as legacy in the future of software. It, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't die. Yeah. So we've we've um, we've discussed a number of times. You know, will Gen AI um, kill low code? Will will you know will AI driven code? I, I actually don't want to dive into that. I, th I think we've beaten that horse to death, and and hopefully listen. It's the opposite. But I want to I want to make one point though. It is the yeah. opposite. Gen AI is gonna blow low code no code Let's more than a, the, a rocket ship. Let's jump on that. Let's jump on that, Francis, because there's two themes that we that we've that we've dialed into. One is obviously Gen AI. Gen AI ha has the ability to make the development experience more accessible, better, and faster. Uh, you know, and and as you answer it, I'd love to get your thoughts on on where Peg is going with with Gen AI Blueprint. Um, I think it's really cool. Um, but others are doing cool things as well. And the second thing is. Is an orchestration engine is is a process automation system in the same way it can consume AI. It can consume the best out there of other generative AI services and bring them in line into a process. Where's your head on all of this? And am I smoke? Am I am I being hoodwinked on how cool Blueprint is? No, you're not being hoodwinked, but I'm going to bring it back to be more neutral. The last seven months, I've actually yep. gone and spoken to and looked at the products of the low-code, no-code vendors. So, uh, you know, seven years of working for one vendor, but the last, been able to look more broadly, I think has given me a better perspective here. But one couple of things, I want to pick up on this word development. I think the future is building software. It's not mm -hmm. development. Development for software engineering, we build applications. If we use the word development, it scares me because we go back to this legacy model, but that's just, just a <laughs> slight bar. The other thing you talked about orchestration. I see people, I see people turning to process mining because they don't orchestrate work. If they were to orchestrate work, they would leave, they still need process mining, but it would, it would be less necessary, right? Because you should orchestrate work, even bad work, good, bad, and ugly work. Orchestrate the hell out of it because you get visibility and then you get the AI can start to predict where your work is, where it's going to go, where it might end up so you can preempt things. That's all orchestration, workflow engines. That's what they should be and everybody should have one for all work, right? That's, that's just my passion. Now come back to Blueprint, but more importantly, AI on low code. What is low code, no code really? It's back to the term model application development. If you remember those terms, right? the old guys do, right? If you build something in a model, it's easily describable, right? Your rules live in a rules engine. They can even be built on a model so that they're well understood and they're clear. You know, the, the model itself will describe how an application will end up being run and where it's run and how it's run. If you build it in the model, if a new mobile device comes along beyond the only two I know today, which is Apple really and, 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 and uh, Samsung, right? If a new one came along and you built in the model, it would immediately run on it with a little bit of work from the, from, from the, you wouldn't have to go and hire a team that knows how to understand Motorola's new WAP 4, whatever they might call it, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that is the most important part of all of this is, the, is, is putting that model. So now when you see how AI, Gen AI is accelerating all the low code vendors, of course it will. All Gen AI has to do is learn the model. So Blueprint, fantastic, and kudos to, to Pega and some of the other uh, vendors that are doing this. And what I want to start digging into, I'm going to be at Pega World in a few weeks as well, I want to dig into how is it different to someone else's Blueprint? Because Gen AI can take this model, put it into, pe sorry, take this, uh, this, this uh, a PDF form of a business process, and you put it into Blueprint, i.e. the model that describes how Pega works, and you get an application from it, right? Well. You could build all these models, and if they're if they're known, and and the LLM start to learn all of the different uh, low code, no code models, then it's going to be. This is why the future, I say, is bright because any good idea is going to flow everyone. Now it comes back down who has the best low code engine, whether that's execution, security, governance, etc. So you're going to see Gen AI. This is why it said to you about blowing the low code, no code uh, uh, out of the water, because Gen AI is going to do that in the model. So all the low-code, no-code vendors are going to benefit from it. And of course, if you've got old low-code technology and old no-code technology, and there are some legacy laggards out there with older technology, and I've seen that too, 
then you're putting a bit of a band aid with the Gen AI in. It can help it, but you're going. But as a, this is where we all help, right? We look at those products and we can help advise clients on how to do that. But when right. we look deep with inside these products, they're generating in the model. You're going to see. Well, we're already seeing it. Look at I, I was at Appian World as well as with you, Rob, right? Yep. And and I'm going to Pega World, and I'm I'm seeing fantastic ingenuity of things that are being created because they've got a model to play with. They're not having to think about oh, well, was that written in COBOL or Java? Was that componentized, containerized, projects? Like, what what subroutines? I mean, no, it's a model, right? Then you could have Gen AI build you a new rule. You could have Gen AI go to the model and say, has anybody done this before? Yeah, you know what? 70% of the application you're asking for, here are, the, here are the components you need. There you go. And so we'll see that come fast and furious. And for all of us that have been sitting in 40 years in the low code, no code, 4GL market, we're going to have a great time. Yeah, I mean, I guess I have this, I guess I have this, 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 this vision of something like a blueprint AI or something, something, something along those lines tells me exactly what is the perfect, what is, what is the, per the, per the standard of the industry, what is the best credit card onboarding process that you can possibly have? And then my internal process mining is then an overlay on top of that that says these are the unique things that we do that are different. And then humans are looking at an application and a model and they say, this is how we would tweak it. And then we fire it off and, and off it goes and then and then it and then it continues to live. So, you know, I, I guess I, I'm seeing this kind of blue sky vision that lives somewhere between between generative AI, low code, digital process automation, process mining, and and bringing humans more deeply in, into the loop of, of development. Um look, I think it I th I think it's gonna get boring in the nicest way, right? Because application building is gonna become so easy. But where the exciting part is for the careers is now how do you differentiate as a bank? If my credit card onboarding is the same as your credit card onboarding, as I believe it should be, because you're not gonna get rewarded if yours costs twice as much, but it isn't a lot better. Where you're gonna get rewarded is you can now focus on where you want to differentiate. In the old yeah. days, I walked into one bank, came out of the store, walked into another bank. It was the relationship that I had that made me choose a particular bank. It's not going to be because my onboarding process is better in the future, is it? I mean, it can't yeah. be. I mean, this because that means that you're probably paying twice as much and you have less money to be innovative as a business. I think, I think there's another sort of future, you know, opportunity, which is you mentioned um pega you know pega's uh, approach with blueprints and having a model pega also has a ton of data about processes uh, for how many years of work um and you mentioned you know um you mentioned organizations that that are not orchestrating their work and therefore they don't they don't know how that work is done they don't have all that data Assembling data set, those data sets, assembling large language mo and building large language models, it seems to me is a huge opportunity because, you know, your typical company, even big companies, they don't have all this data. They don't. Model. They don't. But they, they were also side a sandbag let's just say they were sandbag because with all the code made them more complicated than they needed to be let's be honest we've all been involved in process so i mean salonis have a thing called the process uh, uh process uh intelligence graph mm -hmm. which is going to bring together all the different process maps from all the different people and i think that's a really good thing because you start to get yeah. visibility on how common processes are or actually where they're yeah. not common and then you can decide why same thing with say pega you know it's got access to all of those um, processes i think that's also important um, and I think it's going to be a race to the top for all the low-code, no-code vendors. And and I think that, you know, Pega has got some phenomenal stuff. Appian's got some phenomenal stuff. The proof's going to be in the pudding. How quickly can we use that technology to build something and prove? And one of the things I did want to share with you guys here, because I've been thinking about this for three or four months, and Rob, I shared it with you when we were at, uh, at Appian World. I want to bring back something that happened about 30 years, 40 years ago. There was a 4GL Grand Prix which brought together all of the 4GL competitors in a competition to build an application that was judged by their peers to, to, to say, how quickly can you build an application and is it right and ripe, yeah. right? I'm fast forwarding a lot more meat to that. I think we need to bring that back. I hope you guys would help me, you know, evangelize this and even be a part of it, maybe judging or whatever you want to be a part of. Automation, but I think we need to get tech sponsor the... 
you know, I think that this is what we need to, it's time for these organizations. If we, so we are, we're all passionate on low code, no code. So let's help these companies put their money where their mouth is and show the world that this is real and then yeah. show the world where they differentiate and how you can choose one vendor or another or one technology over another. And I think we've been missing this. It's 40 years in the making, but it's time. Let's get everybody together, a big event, big competition, bring the service partners, delivery partners. It's also gonna be about delivery, right? Yep. Bring everybody together, bring ideas, and let's just make this happen. What a gas. <laughs> Would love to. Francis, yeah. thank you so much for joining us today. This has been so much fun. John, thank you for, for co-hosting. Thanks to everybody who's who's tuned in to listen. And um, uh, if you have comments, if you are vendors that want to be part of the Grand Prix, please let us <laughs> let know. Us know. I think this is the coolest idea I've heard in a long time. Uh, if you want to dive deeper with Francis, uh, you can find him at automationden.com. Um, and, uh, and thank you all for joining us. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you.